down uh, half of the years just that little point there at this scale. So, big demand. <coughs> um, civilian uh, instruments that provide data, like we're going to show you Landsat data and ASTER data, but uh, a lot of countries have satellites that are gathering the Earth remote sensing data. Typically, they're in the five meter at best, but more likely 10 or 15 meter spatial resolution. And governments have made the conscious <coughs> decision to stay at that level or higher, and they've turned over the high resolution data provision to commercial companies. So if you want images at one meter resolution for your area, you have to go to somebody like um, QuickBird or like you know, e Econos or any of the half dozen commercial companies, and they will sell you data at fairly high prices. But that's about the only place you can get satellite data at high spatial resolution. Otherwise, you would need to uh, turn to aircraft or maybe uh, an unmanned aircraft or helicopter with standard photography or scanners. So the data that we have, uh, we're, we're going to look at it from, uh, mostly from Landsat and from Aster, two instruments that have data in the 15 to 30 meter range. So bear that in mind as far as how you're going to use the data. We're all familiar with blue, green, red, and you put them together, and that's what our eyes see. So we have a blue image, an image taken in the green, an image taken in the red, you put them together, and you get a true color image. So this is the basis of all the kinds of imagery that we look at and interpret visually is putting three bands together, assigning one to blue, one to green, one to red, and you get an image. So the, you know, there's not a lot of vegetation here. It's fairly dark. But the vegetation is brightest in the green compared to the blue and the red. So this is the visible spectrum. So if we move a little further out into the spectrum, we're, we're talking about the, uh, the infrared, beyond the red where the eye can't see. Vegetation is very bright, and that's shown here. The areas that are vegetated turn out to be the brightest in the infrared region. But when we make it, we have to display the bands with our blue, green, red colors. So you get something called a false color image. And by far more images are made in false color. We can arbitrarily assign blue, green, and red to any spectral bands. And we make images that have no bearing to the color your eye would see. But the information is what's important. So here, the various shades of red relate to the health and vigor of the vegetation. And you cannot get this easily in other parts of the spectrum, the blue or the green parts. I think this is the last one, something to think about when you're, when you're dealing in it with uh, remote sensing data. And that's the, the trade-off between spatial resolution and the temporal resolution. This is the frequency at which the data are acquired. So I showed a little bit examples of what nominal spatial resolution is. So this scale goes from about uh, 10 decimeters, 10, decimeters no, 10 centimeters, up to, here's a meter, 10 meters, 100 meters, up to 100 kilometers. And here we have frequency starting with, this is 100 years, 10 years, one year, a tenth of a year, so that's about a month, a hundredth of a year, three days, thousandth of a year, point three days, seven hours. So when you look at the combination of the spatial resolution and the frequency, Here's where the different instruments that exist plot. So the weather satellites, we all see this on our nightly newscast. The weather satellites are, have spatial resolutions on the order of five or 10 kilometers. The reason that is, is they want to capture a whole hemisphere of the Earth. They're not interested in clouds that are 100 meters across. They're really irrelevant. You want to see temp, uh, typhoons or weather fronts. But the data can be acquired extremely frequently, like every 15 minutes. As you get to higher and higher spatial resolution, smaller and smaller pixel size, the frequency generally you can capture that information gets worse and worse. So the, the Landsat instruments and many other instruments that um, are used for land remote sensing fall into sort of the 10 to 15 meter range, which is right here. But generally, the repeats are in the order of two weeks, a week to two weeks. And that's because of the orbits they're in and also the amount of data you can transmit to the ground. So you have to match 
the types of data, the capabilities to the application you want, and then decide what kind of data you need. It could be that you know, Landsat, in this case, is totally irrelevant for you. You need data far more frequently than once a week, or once every two weeks. Or you decide you need data that has to be one meter resolution. So that limits where you can go to get the data. So just a, a, a summary here. Um, other things to consider that you cannot get instantaneous data unless you are the United States Department of Defense and you operate your own satellites. Somebody asked me yesterday, you know, I really want to get data immediately for doing some kind of enforcement. I want to be able to you know, hold my handheld computer and get an image taken right then and then go out and arrest somebody. <laughs> the only ones who can do that that I'm aware of is the military who operates their own satellites and they sh it shows up in movies and science fiction and spy books. But in that civilian sector, I'm unaware of that capability existing. So there is a time delay between when the data are acquired and when you get it in your hands. For commercial companies, I think some of them are promising to deliver data maybe in a matter of several hours, four to six hours, from when the data are captured. So that's almost instantaneous, but it's not quite enough to capture the bad guys. In general, the, the delay is, is longer. It's on the order of uh, days, maybe even weeks sometimes. So keep that in mind. Um, a lot of times, the satellite is not going overhead the exact time you need it. And that's just because of orbital mechanics. <coughs> so like Landsat comes over about once every two Landsat satellites once every seven days, but if you need something day three, you just can't get it. Uh, big problem, everybody knows, clouds. If you look globally at millions of images that have been taken around the world, probably about 30% are completely cloud-free. And all the rest of the 70% of the images have some clouds, moderate clouds, and a whole lot of clouds. So that's something we can't control visible part of the spectrum. There are other kinds of uh, imagery that does penetrate clouds, those are microwave radar images, which provide other kinds of data. Uh, spatial resolution is never enough, that's always true. No matter what you're looking at, you always wish you had a better view of it and you had better resolution. But as I said, the, the non-commercial sensors are in the 10 meter range or higher, and commercial sensors provide high spatial resolution, but at high cost. Uh, but you can't get what you want, but you get what you need. <laughs> Isn't that the role of students? In the next few minutes, uh, let me show you a few examples of the, the types of images that have been used for conservation. And also, this is an introduction a little bit to what the terrible capabilities are. But um, if, if Gary didn't, didn't emphasize it, let me emphasize here. There's sort of two parts to what we want to impart to you. One is the, the software, which is a, a, the Terralux software package, that provides some, uh, some analysis tools, some simple GIS capability. But the other part is the, uh, the system we put in place to, to browse and order data. And we'll, that's what we'll all be demonstrating a little bit later. And that allows you access to some very large image databases and the data that are delivered come in a format, the JPEG format, that can be used by almost anything. You don't need Terralook. You can, like I said, you can display it as a, in a Word file, as a Word document, and drop it in PowerPoint, or almost anything. So there, there's two parts to this, but uh, Terralook encompasses both the software and um, the links to the, the data and preparation of the data files. But the data can be used in any program. So uh, three case studies, Gary Dung Lao Sao, uh, Reserve Forest in Laos. One thing I show my age, that the, the globe changed since I learned geography in school. <laughs> and there are some countries I still have no clue where they are. Things change rapidly, so excuse me for some, sometimes reverting to the past. Uh, another area is, is the confluence of the Aguaza and Parana rivers, where Argentina, uh, Brazil, and Paraguay come together. Interesting history there, of what's going on. The other is the capital of Gambia, Banjul. All, all these um, 
example of the show, um, showing how we can look at uh, monitoring things with time and see how things have changed and how the data then can be used if you want for enforcement or to make political decisions or other kinds of decisions. It's to provide the data to make informed decisions. So the first one is in uh, southern Laos. It's a, it's a fairly small area. It's a park that's about 100,000 hectares established in the 19, early 1990s. And since its establishment, coffee growers have been moving into the productive area, into this forest. The scale of the problem was really not known. People in charge of the park did not have the necessary resources or tools to evaluate how much of their park was being affected or really to get a good idea where the boundaries of the park were. So that's what this says in much greater detail. And then um, sometime in the, the, was it the 90s, the park managers purchased some satellite images and discovered how severe the problem was and the extent to which their park had been converted to coffee plantations. So based on that, they <coughs> made a decision to um, suggest cutting out part of the park because it was no longer a park, it was coffee plantations. So here's uh, this is what Terra look, the software looks like, Terra look software. So one of the uh, shape files that's included in the thing are all of the park protected areas and park boundaries for the world and then the country boundaries this just comes up as layers. So here's the park we're going to be looking at. And here's part of the park. So in 1990, here's the boundary of the park. Uh, the dark, very dark green is um, forested areas, less forested areas here, but very little trace of much in the way of development. By 2008, <laughs> this is about 20 years later, here's the dark green forest area, and here are coffee plantations. You don't see a boundary here. Land use is exactly the same. It's all coffee plantations. So look at the two side by side. And then this is the, the, some of the capabilities of Terra with the simple things you can do. Um, we can draw lines around the encroachment area and measure it. And it turns out it's about 90,000 square kilometers, which is a whole lot of the park. There's not much left of it. It's not up here. All coffee plantations. So the recommendation they were thinking of is to remove this part from the park. It's senseless. Another interesting area, one of my favorite areas to look at his, the history of change, is the area around the Guazi Falls. And it falls right at the triple boundary here, you see on the image, of three countries. So here's, here's a piece of a satellite image. So the vegetation is dark green here. Here's the, the rainforest in dark green. This is in 1973. The two rivers, I forget which is which, the Parana and the Guazi River, form the boundaries between the three countries. So Argentina is down here in the south. Paraguay is the left half. And this upper quarter is Brazil. So in 1973, lots of rainforest here in Argentina. This part of Argentina, probably the whole country. Paraguay, the southern part of this piece here, is still heavily forested. They've already started to put in the trellis configuration of roads that is very typical in the Amazon. So a main road is, is put in through a forested area, and then perpendicular to it are all these branch roads. And then if you can see, on each of these branch roads, there are little irregular rectangles, which are farms. So that's the start of the curve. In Brazil, by 1973, almost all the forests had already been converted to farmland. Uh, much of the uh, soybeans, corn, and other things. Like I say, Argentina, not much. Here's Iguazu Falls. This is the airport that serves the tourist industry in Iguazu Falls. And then in Brazil, there's Iguazu Park. Well, here's the western boundary of it. And the northern boundary, you can sort of make it out of here. But clearly, a lot of the park has been eroded. There has been a substantial encroachment into the park by 1973. So let's move forward in time. Here's 1989. Yes. Okay, 1989. So look what's happened in Paraguay. Virtually no rainforest is left. There's still some strips left, a few pieces, but most all the forest is gone. In 
Brazil. Is that Brazil? Yes, that's Brazil. So in Brazil, um, the park boundary now is very, very clear. So they've started enforcing the boundary and preventing people from uh, coming in and clearing. And there's been regrowth there. Now, from this, I probably can't tell you that it's forest, but some vegetation has regrown there. Probably trees are starting to come back. So they've made a conscious effort to enforce this boundary in the park. Argentina, again, very little development in this part of the world. One thing you may have noticed is this extremely large body of water, and the dam, whose name I've forgotten, was put in here, the Tapu Hydroelectric Dam, to provide power. It provides about 25% uh, of the electricity for Brazil and 75% for Paraguay. So it's a major resource for the country. But at the same time, it has buried um, a waterfall that had the largest volume of any in the world. So there's trade-offs. And also as a result, this is a big spur for development. And we'll see that in the next images as we go. So here's 2000. Again, the park boundary is very clearly defined. Argentina, some of the rainforest now has been converted to farmland. Paraguay, nothing but farmland, but also this is now a big city has developed here. The dam is still here, but this is more residential areas uh, than farmlands. 2007, things are pretty much the same as they were 10 years ago. There's not much left to take away. Uh, Argentina has still preserved most of the forest over here, with the exception of over in this part. There's a city there, some more farming here. Brazil is still enforcing their boundary. Paraguay is going to be humanized. Is that the right word? Or no? Um, one other thing is this pair of images show. This is a mosaic of two images, one taken in the dry season and one more in the wet season. So the differences you see right across the border is one of uh, differences in the state of the crops. illustration, I think, of how national policy can shape the landscape. <coughs> we can actually invert that. We can look at the images and infer what the national policy is. So clearly Brazil at some point decided this park is important, probably because of the tourist dollars it brings in. So they decided to enforce the boundary and try to maintain the park. It's always the case. Let's move on. So the last case, the last case study here is a series of images for Banjo and the Gambia, which is in far west Africa. Uh, it's an interesting city because it essentially lies on the tip of a peninsula. And it is uh, surrounded by first mangroves and then um, forested areas. And as we look what happens over time, the huge increase in population has led to a, essentially elimination of all the forest areas around it, growth of urban centers, urbanization around it. But the mangroves have been preserved. So we can clearly see that. So here it is in 1979. So here's the capital city sitting on this little peninsula. The mangroves are the dark green. Here, here's some more mangroves, here's some more mangroves. And in all of this area is maybe some scattered farmland, but very little habitation you can see here. 1986, really dramatic change. Uh, most of this is, has been converted to farmland. The city has no place to grow. So we'll see the urbanization starting to move out in this direction. The mangroves remain, which is really surprising. We haven't touched them. By 2000, and this is all urbanized here. Another urban center developing here, farmland here to feed all the people. The population has tripled or about five times. 2006, uh, mangroves still. So we'd be in good shape. This is almost all urbanized now. Very little is converted. It's just, it remains as farmland. So one really the good thing you can do with satellites is besides looking at what the present state of the landscape is, we have a continuous record of this one satellite in way for 30 years. All the data are absolutely consistent. They can be compared 30 years ago to today. What you see then and what you see now are the same. You can interpret them as the same. There's been no change in how the instruments have behaved. The data have been uh, processed to provide the same information regardless of what they're taking. And then we have a little thing. Okay, I think that's okay.
Who else did you, did you get, you're going to get 